Hi to whoever's listening and watching. I'm going to read another chapter of this book by Ralph Moody, The Fields of Home. And as you can see, it looks like it might take place in Maine, and it does. Apparently it's haying time on that farm. And anyway, uh, I got a request from my son Bert and his friend Cora in China. He teaches there in an international school to hear some of this book. So, this is chapter 2. I read chapter 1 the other day. Chapter 2. Grandfather's House. And that's something like what the house looks like. Let's see now. In reality, I don't know if you can see it behind the, to the left of the band back there, as once Bert and his brother Gary and I drove to Lisbon Falls and we found that house. It's still there. The band's gone now, but the house is still there. So, I knew the buildings on the old place the moment I saw them. Just as Mother had told us, they were set on the brow of the last rise of ground before the hill swept up to form Lisbon Ridge. She had always said the valley lay like a great salad bowl, and that Lisbon Ridge was the west rim of the bowl. From where I walked, I could un understand why she said it just that way. Pine, birch, and maple woods covered the crest of the ridge, and the buildings seemed to be nestled in below them. The square, weather-blackened, two-story house, with slow-pitched roof rising from four sides to meet the great brick chimney, stood near the roadway. Two elms, so tall their branches reached out above the roof, stood before it. And running back, almost to join with the great white band, there was a line of smaller buildings. I knew every one of them from the stories I'd heard Mother tell. First would be the summer kitchen, then the bee shop and the woodshed. The taller one would be the carriage house and forge, with the privy and hen houses beyond. Before I realized it, I was climbing the hill so fast I was panting. I was halfway up when I heard a dog back. The sound came from the direction of the band, but it was muffled. Then there was a shrill squeal of a pig, and a man yelled in a high-pitched voice. In a moment, a woman's voice came sharp and clear. Get out, you fool! And the pig shrieked again, as if it were being tortured. I dropped my suitcase and ran through a field of standing hay towards the sounds. The band was built on the shoulder of a hill, so that the main floor was on a level with the dooryard. On the downhill side, the foundation of huge boulders rose 15 feet above the sloping meadow and ran forward toward the house in a wedge-shaped wall. In the band foundation, there were two doorways large enough for a wagon to pass through, and the noise sounded as though it was coming from inside of them. The squealing and shouting grew, and I ran up through the hayfield as fast as I could make my legs go. When I reached the big doors, I was all out of breath, the sun was so bright I couldn't see into the darkness under the van. While I was peering in, a man yelled, Head him off! Head him off, boy! And then I went heels overhead into a puddle of band slops. Oh, in the split second before I fell, I saw a big black hog with a shepherd dog dragging at his ear come shooting out of the darkness. I bumped my head when the hog knocked me over. It was dizzy when I tried to get onto my feet. For a few seconds, I just balanced myself there on my hands and knees while things seemed to, be go, seemed to go floating around me. The dog, shrieking like a fire whistle, went racing away. The doorways of the band seemed to be teetering. Framed in one of them was a woman in a pink dress, holding a broom like a baseball bat and yelling. In the other was a little man with a big reddish beard that I knew must be grandfather. He was waving a long-handled shovel and shouting, Tunnel, idiot! Why didn't you head him off? Who be you? Who sent you here? That, When he said, who be you, I remember when adult men in, in this area, when I was a kid, used to say that, how be you, or who be you. They used that phraseology. My father did sometimes. You don't hear it now, but you did then. With my good suit ruined and his shouting at me, I couldn't help being peeved. I climbed to my feet and I snapped right back. Ralph Moody, my mother sent me. We were standing facing each other through the doorway. Grandfather weighed about a hundred pounds. The top of his head came about level of my chin. When I spoke, both arms dropped to his sides. He looked up into my face, almost the way a dog looks up at you when he wants to be petted, and said, Why, 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 you're Mary's boy. You're Ralphie. 
Grandfather and I, grandfather and I just stood there for a full minute. Then he took both my arms in his hands and said, Stand around here, Ralphie. Stand around so as your old grandpa can get a look at you. By fire, you're going to make a tall one, just like your father. He gave his head a couple of quick nods, looked up at my face again. Favor him, too, he said. Then he squeezed the muscles in my arms and nodded once more. Got the same kind of hard, stringy build. Your father was a powerful, stout man for a slim build. Millie, come here. See my daughter Mary's boy. Millie had already come. She looked at my dripping suit and said, Well, he ain't a sight for sore eyes. Better fetch him up to the house while I get some water hat. Them clothes will stink like a polecat if I don't get them washed out pretty devilish quick. Then she snapped at me. Didn't you fetch no clean clothes? She only waited long enough for me to tell her there were clean clothes in my suitcase and that I left it beside the road. Well, fetch it, she said, and started climbing up over the boulder wall to the dooryard. What? Oh. She was nearly as tall as I, and was neither fat nor thin. I thought she must be about thirty, just as Mr. Swale had said. From the easy way she went up the side of the high wall, I could see she was as strong as a man. And though she spoke and acted rough, her face didn't look that way. It wasn't wrinkled, it was white instead of tanned. Her eyes were blue, her hair was dark brown. It was drawn tight back from a white padding place in the middle, braided, and wound into a big knot at the back of her head. From the top of the wall, she looked back and said, Well, go fetch it. Don't stand there gawking like a ninny. Then she turned and walked away. Grandfather squeezed my arm again and almost shouted, Gory sakes alive, Ralphie, your old grandpa's powerful glad to see you, boy. How's Mary? How's all the rest of the children? Six of you, ain't there? Seen Levi of late? Yes, sir, I said. Everybody's fine. Mother said she'd write you a letter. And then I started back along the track I'd made through the hayfield. I'd only taken a couple of steps when Grandfather caught my sleeve and said, No, Ralphie, we'll go roundabouts so as we don't tump down the hay, make it hard mowing. Want to show you my new swarm of bees, black belts, fetched, them, fetched on from up to Canada, powerful good honeymakers and a thundering great colony of them. Calculate they'll be swarming afore long. As he talked, he led me along the foot of the boulder wall toward a dozen or so white beehives. They were set, held a skelter, under two great apple trees, just a few yards down the hill from the side of the house. All I knew about bees was that they had stingers and made honey, and that I'd a lot rather go without the honey than to have the stings. Grandfather didn't seem to feel that way. He kept a tight hold of my arm, ducked low, led me in under the nearest tree. Bees were as thick in the air as flies around a molasses barrel. Two of them lit on his whiskers. I was sure I could feel one crawling on the back of my neck. I made a quick move to brush it off, but Grandfather caught my arm and said, Take care, take care. You got to be gentle with bees. Might sting you. Grandfather reached out and took the cover off the nearest looking hive. Off the, I'm sorry, took the cover off the newest looking hive. Inside, it was alive with crawling bees. Down in the cracks between the dividers, I could see them squirming over each other, and it made the nerves under my skin squirm the same way. I wanted to get out of there as fast as I could, but Grandfather whispered, Gory sakes alive, Ralphie. Mac out there are fetching in the honey. By thunder, won't some of that on hot biscuits hit the right spot come next winter. Your old grandpa will learn you all about bees. Curious critters, bees. Let's cover them over, leave them to their work. Then he eased the top of the hive. On, <laughs> I've got to start over again. Then he eased the top onto the hive carefully. I was awfully glad when we ducked out from under the tree. The thing I wanted most was to get my suitcase and a bath, but Grandfather wouldn't hurry. He kept holding my arm as though I were a horse and had a halter rope, and he'd stop me every time he wanted to say something. We just out, ducked out from under the apple tree when he stopped and said, Don't calculate. You recollect the old place very good, Ralphie. You was just a sniveling wet-nosed young one when Mary last fetched you down. Long wood shaving curls. Same color as new pine. Never liked curls on a boy. Gory sakes, how time does fly. Must have been in the summer of 98, a year before I bought the Bolton Woodlot. It couldn't have been, I told him. I wasn't born until December of that year. T'was too. Grandfather fled up for just a second. 
Then he seemed to catch himself and said, Well, what's the odds? "'Twas the four married to Charlie and you children gallivanting off out west. "'Now what was it I was about to show you?' "'Grandfather pushed his battered old hat back "'and scratched the little bald spot on his head. "'Now that's curious, ain't it? "'Twas right on the tip of my tongue. "'Great thunderation. "'Don't calculate your grandpa's getting old enough to be forgetful, do you? "'Course not. Course not. I ain't but seventy-two. "'Gory says, father was older than I be before ever I was born.' House is thirty-odd years old than I be. There, there, Ralphie. That done it. Mack that humper ground yonder, twixt the pear main and the black Oxford apple trees. That's where father built his first house. Year of 1794. The one where the owls came down the chimney and stole the cat. Gurry sakes alive. The old kettle's round here somewheres. Like it's not, it's up in the open chamber. Used to pit it over the cat come night so as the owls couldn't steer her away. Some day I'd like to see it, I said. Don't you think I'd better get my suitcase now? Gory sakes, yes, Grandfather said, and started leading me toward the roadway. Better get it before the woodchucks does. Tunnel, pesky critters. Old Bess ain't been keeping them down of late the way she used to. Eyes is getting bad. Tunnel shame the way a man and a dog starts a falling to pieces before their time. Old Bess ain't more than fourteen. Be you, girl. I've been looking out for bees so hard I ain't noticed Bess was with us. As though she understood every word Grandfather said, she put a muzzle against his knee and closed her eyes as he stroked her head. Before she closed them, I noticed they were both milky blue, and that the sides of her face were grizzled like an old man's beard. Poor old Bess, poor old Bess, Grandfather half whispered as he stroked her. I and her kept house together nigh under ten years afore Millie come. By fire, I must have miscalculated somewhere. Let me see. Let me see. Want Bess here once Mary fetched your children down home before she went off out west? I don't know, I said. She didn't bring me that time. Don't you think I'd better get my... That's as far as I got. Grandfather didn't seem to have heard me. He slapped his legs so hard that Bess jumped, and he almost shouted, Gurry sakes alive now, I recollect. Frankie fetched her home before he went off to Portland to learn a trade. Come out of a litter old Sid Perrington's bitch had. Must have been the early spring of 97. Great thunderation. Don't seem like it was more than a fortnight ago. Yes, sirree. I recollect best being along when I dickered with Sid for the Bowden Woodlot. Got an eruption with a tunnel great skunk. Stunk to high heaven. I had to wash her belly off with vinegar before her puppies would nurse. <laughs> Grandfather kept holding my arm till we were nearly halfway to my suitcase. And then he stopped suddenly and pointed up across the fields toward the woods that covered the hilltop half a mile to the south. Mark that all fired great white oak yonder, he asked me. I didn't know much about trees, and at that distance I couldn't tell one from another. The hill sloped away eastward toward the valley. At the highest point there was a low growth of dark green that looked to me like pine. A little further down the color was lighter. Tree tops had rounded domes, so I thought they'd be hardwood. Near the bottom of the slope the color was so dark it looked almost black. The growth was heavy enough that it seemed to be a solid bank with, here and there, a steeple-shaped top rising above the bank. Near the center, two great trees rose high above the others. They stood shoulder to shoulder against the skyline, like twin brothers in waist-high clover. You mean one of those big ones in the dark patch, I asked him? Oak, oak, I told you, and them's virgin pine. What ails you? Thought Levi said you was a farmer. Don't you know oak from pine? Yonder, yonder in a line between Naya's field and the orchard wall. I could see a scraggly old orchard on the near side of the hill, a stone wall around it, but I had no idea which might be Naya's field. Grandfather's big jointed finger shook enough that he could have been pointing at a thousand trees. Yonder, yonder, he said again, twixt some seedling pines and beech woods. I didn't like his shouting at me, or his acting as if I was a complete idiot. I didn't care which tree he was talking about just so long as he'd hurry up and get it over with. I didn't shout back at him, but my voice was a little louder than it should have been when I said, I can see it. Grandfather's voice dropped down till it was as gentle as it had been when he was petting Bess, thundering great tree in it. You wouldn't hardly believe it, Ralphie, but Father's sheep ate off the top of it once he first took up the land, had to fence it roundabouts with poles to save it. Ate it back so far it goed three trunks from a single stump. 
You map that Norway pine to the westward, the one on the line between the two Gravenstein trees across, atop the orchard? Oh, I can't understand. Okay. I would never even heard of a Norway pine, but I nodded my head, and my voice was quiet when I said, Yes, sir. That's where the parent tree stood, Ralphie, tallest white oak in all the country roundabouts. The one father climbed when he blazed his way inland from the Androscoggin, and the Almighty mapped him this piece of ground. Lightning blasted it while I was off to the war, strong as iron. Only one little log of it left. I'm saving that for wagon tongues. Did ever I tell you, Ralphie, about... Millie's voice broke in as though she was shouting through a megaphone. Vittles is getting cold. Vittles, 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 Grandfather snapped. Tunnel, pesky woman. Can't think of nothing but vittles and scrubbing. Worse than Levi. Then his voice dropped it down. And he said, Wish Levi had come home. Ain't been down since the snow went off. Better fetch your valise, Ralphie. Millie won't be fit to live with if her vittles get cold. Then he and Bess started slowly back toward the house. When I brought my suitcase into the dooryard, Millie was waiting on the back door stone. Her voice was sharp when she frowned at me and said, The soap and a tub of water in the woodshed. Better use them good and plenty. I ain't going to have no dirty, stinking boys around here. Then she turned and went into the house. I scrubbed till I was redder than fire, dried myself, pulled on my clean clothes, emptied the tub, hurried to the kitchen door. From what I'd already heard, I expected to find Grandfather and Millie at each other's throats, but they were both at the table and seemed as happy as a couple of birds in the spring. Come right in, Ralphie, come right in, Grandfather called. Millie baked us a nice good sugar cake for dinner. Never see any woman could bake a better sugar cake than Millie. Anyone could have seen that Millie liked to have him say it, but she stuck her nose up a little and said, Tin up to my usual. Devilish getcho birch I've been getting for firewood ain't fit for fence rails. It is, yeah. Because oh. <laughs> well, she says I'm reading too fast. I'll read that paragraph again. Anyone could have seen that Millie liked to have him say it, but she stuck her head up a little, stuck her nose up a little, and said, Tain up to my usual. Devilish getcho birch I've been getting for firewood ain't fit for fence rails. Got to stand and blow on it to get spack enough to melt grease. The dinner was boiled potatoes and fried salt pork, just as Mr. Swale had said it would be. But there was plenty of it, and it was good. Grandfather taught more than he ate, and he kept his knife waving as he taught, sort of like a band leader. Two or three times, he dropped the piece of pork he had balanced on, the, on it, and then he put the empty knife into his mouth. <laughs> Gory shakes alive, Millie, he said, with Ralphie here to help us. I calculate we'll have the hay a-flying like goose feathers. Wouldn't it be a mite surprise if we had it all fetched home to the mouse before company reunion time. Ain't been to reunion since... Curry sakes. Ain't been since the first year you come, the summer Levi was to home. Wish I Levi had come down this summer. He sat looking at his plate for a minute. Then his head jerked up and said, Eat your vittles, Ralphie, eat your vittles. Calculate to get a start on the orchard hay this afternoon. I'll go proven to the horses. And that's the end of chapter two. Whew, wow. <laughs>